Hi, I'm Joe Tripodi with Coca-Cola. I'm the uh, Chief Marketing and Commercial Officer of Coke. Uh, you know, as the world is evolving, particularly as brands and consumers are evolving at such fast paces, the opportunities are quite dramatic and the challenges are dramatic. Uh, from an opportunity point of view, you know, real-time engagement with consumers, understanding where they are constantly, you know, the whole kind of uh, framework of heavy social influence, heavy mobile influence, heavy gaming influence, all of those things are factors that are playing on uh, how consumers behave and how their, their engagement with brands change quite dramatically. Now the implications obviously for research are quite significant because a lot of this now means that we have to get real-time, highly engaged, real-time measurements of how people, the beauty of this I think is that instead of people telling us what they're going to do, we actually see what they're actually doing, which is a big thing that as we all know so much in our life as, uh, as people focused on, on, uh, on the consumer and how consumers behave, sometimes what they tell you is not what they actually do. And so I think with this, all this new world order, kind of new world order of consumer engagement and the change that's occurring around, around consumers and how they engage with brands, what really gives us a unique opportunity to, to, uh, to understand the motives that people are using, understand how exactly they're behaving, and then hopefully kind of project ahead how that's all going to be involved so that instead of looking in the past in order to predict the future, we're looking real time now in order to say hey, this is how we're, going to, uh, how we're going to engage with those consumers in a more effective way in order to ultimately to get them to buy our products. One of the things that we're working on quite a bit is through mobile, which is of course uh, you know, the cell phone is the remote control for people's lives now, is how you can use that to drive uh, behavior and particularly to drive traffic into some of our customers, our retail partners' stores in order to get consumers to actually, uh, let's say, try a new product or to try a, a Coke Zero or whatever. And we're using that kind of uh, mobile couponing in order to drive and, and get consumers to take action against a certain overall objective that we have relative to, rather, relative to either a specific customer or a specific brand in a customer. And so that's proving out to be very interesting because you get that online real-time learning. The other one I would say that we're very excited about is you know, we were reinventing in the U.S. our fountain machine. It's a, a machine called Freestyle. And uh, other than the fact that it gives, uh, the, the, uh, gives people 106 different choices of flavors to match and mix, what it'll also give us is kind of a real-time online lab of what consumers are mixing. And so that can inform innovation decisions and flavor and flavor extensions that we can do uh, and, uh, and then get us to be a lot more, if we see certain combinations of flavors are particularly uh, particularly relevant to consumers and we may want to figure out how we b bring those flavors to the market a lot faster. So I think technology is helping us in a huge way inform a lot of our innovation and I think it's only going to get bigger. The other way is obviously through social and monitoring all the social networks, uh, understanding what, what's the kind of pulse or heartbeat of people around a certain issue or an area. We're using that very aggressively now as we monitor how people, how people in the U.S. particularly, how they react to certain uh, uh, comments about our company, our brands, et cetera, things we do, and get that kind of real-time feedback. And so, you know, historically you'd wait months to get that kind of feedback. Now we can get it on a daily basis. So kind of building an enterprise-wide social media strategy in order to keep our pulse on, uh, on the heartbeat of, of consumers is really critical for us. And I think all these things are factoring into this kind of new world of how, of how we engage with people and how people engage with brands. It's exciting, actually. That's an interesting question of how you attract and engage consumers in the social world because we, actually, we have a philosophy of not being overly heavy handed. We want to be what we call fans first and from a fans first is, is we've done almost no marketing of Coke uh, um, or uh, you know for the company that has the world's largest Facebook presence at 23 million fans. We are very passive in how we use that. We want to be very protective of those relationships because we don't want to seem like we're being overly commercial to those people. Now, I always laugh and I joke with people and they say, well, Starbucks passed you and they now have more. And I said, yes, that's because they did a pastry promotion last week. We're not doing a lot of that. 
Um, but what we want to do is, as you said, you know, have these kind of other smaller micro communities around certain interest areas and find p places for or where people can aggregate and go in order to find common interests and how they engage in common interests. And with that, I would tell you that one of our most successful was, let's say, around the World Cup last year. Um, you know, that there was so much passion around the World Cup and what the World Cup did around the world that we set up a number of different microsites where we could aggregate people of certain fan interest around certain aspects of the program and people could get and go there and then talk to one another. So we want to be a facilitator, not heavy handed, it's about facilitation of spawning these communities for people all around the world who have common interests. One of the best examples I think we have of that rec of recently is, is about two weeks ago we launched this Jennifer Aniston video around smart water. And so it was almost an anti-video video because the way Jennifer handled it, uh, you know, she's, she was in her own unique way just basically saying, you know, I'm told I have to do, I have to go virus or have a virus and then go viral, of course. Hi. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. Uh, what are you doing? I'm lip syncing. Yeah, no, I know that, and it's really, really adorable. But uh, do you do you know any songs about water? No. Hi, I'm Jen Aniston, and I'm here to talk to you about smart water. But in this day and age, apparently, I can't just do that, can I? Can't just tell you that smart water is the smartest, best tasting water that's out there. I have to make a video, apparently, that. Um, turns into a virus. Viral. So, uh, we need the video to go viral. Right, sorry, viral. Thank you. This is why I have these three lovely internet boys here to help me. So, apparently, well, animals are huge online. Do we have animals? Oh, you're, oh, so sweet. Can you say, I love smart water? I don't know, out of there. I love smart water. Rachel, I love your hair. Okay, that's enough. I don't want to, let's try to think of something else. Okay, well that's adorable. Look at you guys. Look at them. This, wait, what are you doing? No, no, no. No dirty dancing, babies. It'll get us more views. It'll also get us arrested. Babies, stop that. You really can't do that yet. Where's the mommy? Full on double rainbow all the way across the sky. What's going on? Oh my God. Hi, honey, are you okay? It's so beautiful. What? Come on, let's, let's get you up. Here, have some smart water. What did they do to you? Anything else, what, what's left? Oh my God, Jen Aniston, I have been in love with you forever. <clears throat> oh. Sorry, apparently that's worth about 100,000 hits. Not for me. God, is it? Is it hot in here? <laughs> I'm fired. Well, in closing, I would like to say that smart water is the purest tasting water there is. What are we gonna call this video? Jen Aniston's sex tape? I love it. Uh, and it was very amusing and engaging and within a very short time we had uh, I think over 5 million views and it's well over that now. But the whole point is it, you don't want to, it can't be overly, it can't be forced, you know. And so when we look now at that whole world, you know, uh, we, when we look and aggregate we're much more focused on expressions than we are in impressions. Impressions, when we look at the total unisphere of Coke, you know, or in the, in the digital world, we'll see maybe 140 million plus kind of references to Coke. But the reality is only about 20 million of those are from us. The other 120 million are coming from the fans, the, the people who love the brand and love the company. And so it's critical for us to understand and make the distinction between what we really want are expressions. I'm a little dubious on the metric of impressions, but I'm more positive on expressions. I used to think when you thought about brand and brand building that the highest area, the highest on the pyramid from no awareness to awareness, consideration to preference to loyalty was loyalty. Then 
I started realizing it wasn't. It was there was something above loyalty. It was advocacy. And if you get people advocating for you and your brand and what you're doing as a company or as a brand, that is unbelievably powerful. Because it's one thing for us to stand up for it. It's another for someone else to come and endorse it. Give you the most recent example is where we we have a thing called Plant Bottle. Plant Bottle is the first. A PET bottle that's 30% made from uh, from sugarcane waste, so it's totally organic. We licensed that to Heinz for Heinz ketchup, and we had a big announcement on this a few weeks ago. But what was powerful about it, and we stood up and said, Go, "Here's Plant Bottle." We wouldn't get anywhere near the recognition or the positive uh, PR as a company than if a third party like Heinz said, "You know, we looked at this and we want that too." And so getting other people to speak on your behalf is much better than you beating your chest and kind of talking about things. So I think everyone is navigating through this world of change in a different way. Uh, we, you know, when we think of the new model, it's you know, obviously the paid, earned, owned, and for us as a fourth, it's shared. It's shared what we share with our retail, our customer partners. We have 20 million customers around the world. So we, when we go into their store, their store, we're sharing their assets in there. And that, and understanding how you fully leverage all of those in, in a unique way in order to build that and enhance our overall consumer engagement, that's really the challenge for us in navigating through this very different world that we're, we're living in where consumer engagement is changing so dramatically. We certainly see a huge business opportunity in recycled PET turning into furniture, clothing lines, etc. And I think that we'll have some pretty big, fairly big announcements on that in the near future. One of the most important things that we see in, you know, when we want to, what, what Coke has done well for many decades is capitalize on consumer passion points, music, sports, particularly football or the Olympics or whatever. Uh, the NBA, etc. But one of the real new passion points that we see all around the world, and not just in developed markets, but developing markets also, is sustainability. And so we have a program called Live Positively, which has multiple dimensions of sustainability. That because there's very few companies in the world that have the the depth and breadth of supply chain that that we have. And so in each of those categories, whether it's water, or carbon footprint, or recycling, or communities, you know, we have very deep programs where we're ingrained at a local level in helping, helping make the world a better place. And, and so um, as uh, part of that, though, is engaging the people at a local level, because it's no longer just, we're going to write you a big check and give you that. It's really going to be, what are the things that need to be done together in order to make one plus one equals three? And we have the resources and we've got the infrastructure in order to be able to help solve some of these problems. Not ourselves entirely, but in a civil society mode where we can partner with civil society and governments in order to advance on so many different dimensions. And I think that that, thing, that is taking, I would say that there's probably nothing that takes up more of my time uh, than everything we're doing around sustainability and live positively to ensure that we're a good global citizen because the nature, the vast nature of Coke and what we're involved with as the world's largest beverage company impacts some areas that are absolutely critical that we as a company feel that we can, we can do really well by doing good. And that's what it comes down to. People really feel much better about the company they work for, its values as an organization. We've got what we call our six P's, and one of the P, you know, it's pro profit, partner, et cetera, uh, productivity. But one of the, the most important P's is planet. And we have specific uh, metrics. We have very deep partnerships with World Wildlife Fund, Greenpeace, and many, many organizations around the world. So they're not going to let us go. We've, we've got to make sure that we made a commitment to those people. We're going to meet those commitments. It's commitments as rel relative to water, water reuse. It's commitments relative to carbon, our carbon footprint. Uh, it's commitments across the spectrum of areas. And, um, and so we're, this is something that I think as the employees of the company feel so much more positive about the company uh, once they know everything we're doing. In fact, that, that's one of the challenges is we don't think people know enough about what we're doing because I frequently go to people and I said, do you, you know, do you know that Coke, you know, has the world's largest recycling plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina, that Coke has the, you know, has spent tens of millions of dollars on HIV education in Africa, that Coke has 250 active water projects to improve the water situation in countries around the world, and, and people don't know any of that. And so, uh, part of what we have to do and what I have to do as a, as a marketer uh, is to get people to understand that. Not to chess beat, but, all, but to get people to understand that these are 
important issues for the planet, important issues for society, and important issues for our company, and all that is, and, and also important issues for our business, and that they're all, it's not mutually exclusive. I think we're looking to use speed, in, uh, particularly in innovation, and innovation around product. And I think I described earlier that from the freestyle machine, how that can give us online, real-time uh, discussion of, of what consumers are preferring from a product point of view. Uh, also in a social media channel, how, you know, getting those insights, we can use speed from, through social media in order to be able to respond more rapidly to consumers' concern about an issue or to uh, get consumer feedback. So all these ways that technology is coming more and more to the forefront and um, uh, using uh, speed obviously to help us through, uh, we've built a thing in the United States called the Coke Digital Network and uh, allows us to deliver online real-time messaging uh, at a day parted level into a, so instead of having a static billboard you know that just says for you know the entire day coke coke open happiness it can it can allows us to we we have built a system and it's a very complex content management capability but in order to make sure that the message is relevant at that time we're we're very focused now on precision marketing and when i talk about precision marketing i talk about the threading the needle of the message the media the consumer segment in the geography at the right time. When you can do that, you're going to deliver far greater precision and a higher return on investment on your marketing investment, and that will allow you. But but all of these new th these new variables and dimensions give you the speed in order to be able to do that more. All those new data feeds and data sources. So it's an exciting time for marketers. It's challenging, but it's very exciting. You know, I think the skills that researchers need to really help lead, uh, uh, lead change is really around curiosity, intellectual curiosity. It's around uh, inspiration. It's around being prov provocateurs or being provocative. All of those things, I think, are, are, and I think also about taking risks and pushing the envelope. Uh, what we want to see is moving, uh, evolving beyond simply market research into not just consumer engagement, but also a strategic partner with the whole enterprise. We want our market research folks, our inside folks, to be there as partners with us, pushing us, making us uncomfortable. And I always say, you know, if you make us uncomfortable, that is a good thing, you know, uh, because frequently I'm not the target e our audience for, for, uh, for something that we're trying to do. And so having researchers can, uh, and, and insight people who can act as kind of the conscious of the company, who can push you, who can inspire us for a true transformation and can help actually be activists in leading change and the dialogue of change because, you know, the, the puck is going way down there in that corner. So it doesn't do any city any good to dwell on what happened in the past. We need to be going, where is the puck going? We need to skate where that is going. And I think researchers can play a very important role, not the only one, but a part of a fabric of a company, of a large number of people who can come together and help enlighten us and help, and help provide some leadership and inspiration as to where we should be going in order to increase our growth. Because at the end of the day, it's all about how do you drive growth for a business. So Stan's the guy that leads Stan is that man. So do you have an example of him uh, putting you in an uncomfortable spot or taking a risk and pushing you somewhere where you're like, whoa, where are we? Yeah, you know, Stan is pushing us constantly. He's pushed us into this new behavioral targeting through uh, uh, neuroscience technology. Uh, you know, it, uh, he just had the entire, we just uh, did some demonstrations of neuroscience to the entire uh, leadership team, the, you know, the top 125 people in the company. And, you know, people say, well, that's, that's not traditional. It's different. People are wearing these funny hats with these electrodes. What's going on? And so he's pushing that change mandate and making sure that when, when we also think about how we invest uh, our marketing, you know, Stan and others are pushing us in this area of making sure that we look at kind of what we call a 70-20-10 model. And that 70% of your dollars go against those things that you know work and are fairly traditional. 20% is innovating off the 70%. And then 10% is totally ring fence, new money, take risks, go experiment. And I think Stan and Wendy Clark and a number of, of our leaders are pushing us, pushing the company 
to make sure that that 10% gets ring fenced, to make sure that that's used to totally experiment. And if you fail, that's fine. It is okay to fail. Failure is a good thing. The worst thing is if we fail doing the same thing in 25 different countries. That is the definition of insanity, I think. So constant learning. Stan is pushing us. He's built a wonderful global community of insight people. But now we have to move above insight to inspiration, provocation, transformation. That's where I think that Stan is taking us.